feeling your feelings is part of understanding sensory and emotional regulation and the awareness of your feelings. And so many men have been either taught or pushed away their feelings, or you have a stronger part of the logic brain than the emotion brain. And so that's just your makeup. And so it's, it's not really natural for you all to like lean in emotion wise. Welcome to Men This Way. Welcome to Men This Way podcast. What's up? We got Tate Arend on the line. What's up, Tate? What's up, Brian? And we have a special guest today, Dr. Brooke Weinstein. So happy to see you. It's good to see you, Brooke. Glad that you're here. Thank you for coming on. Uh, just say hi, hi to our people, and then I want to do a quick intro for you. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. And it's been a while since we've had a convo, so I'm excited. It has. Yeah. Uh, just to give our listeners some insight into to who who you are, uh, o- only in you know who you are. That's such a loaded question. You, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, but Dr. Brooke Weinstein is a world-renowned thought leader on parenting. She specializes in neuroscience-based sensory and emotional regulation, and we're going to talk about what that means, what that is. She combines a background in occupational therapy and neuroscience, a deep knowledge of the brain, trauma, and sensory regulation principles to offer step-by-step practical parenting advice. And this is what we really want are going to be touching on a lot of today, practical parenting advice, which transforms the entire household. And uh, uh, Brooke, you have been blowing up on Instagram. Uh, I say due to your brilliance, your practical knowledge, and your, and your certainly very engaging presence. Thank you. Um, and I got a question about this next one. You've been featured on Today, Forbes, and Scary Mommy. What the heck is Scary Mommy? <laughs> that was like so long ago. I, it's it's like a spoof um, for moms to, it's like an article and for mom, there's memes and things like that. And so I wrote an article a really long time ago for that. Um, hopefully it was funny. I don't, I don't really remember if it was, it, that was many years ago, but you well, know. Scary Mommy is a funny, I mean, the internet is hilarious. There's so many just hilarious names out there these days. Scary Mommy. Well, Brooke, welcome. We're really honored to have you. Um, yeah, it's good to have you here. Uh, Tate and I have been talking a lot about the the conversation that we want to have with you. Uh, Tate, why don't you get us started? Yeah, I, I was saying just a moment ago to you, Brooke, I'm, I've been so looking forward to this conversation and I've, I've had the, you know, had the opportunity to do a deep dive into your world a little bit. And I have to say that it has been so enlivening and simultaneously heartbreaking for me as a dad of a 13 year old daughter, Alexa, and I've got a 10 year old uh, son, Tate Jr. And as I've been diving into your world and just learning more about, about your background, about what you focus on, I have just learned so much and been heartbroken on the ways that I haven't shown up the way that, that I, I wish that I should and could have now that I've, just been learning more about what you do. So maybe you could just help us help the everyday listener just get a sense of, you know, what does neurosensory based parenting? What what does that even mean? What inspired you to go into it? Maybe you just give us a quick overview. And and Brooke, before you do that, I just want to cut in and say, you know, Tate, Tate is one of the best fathers I know. And he is mm-hmm. so hard on himself. Mm-hmm. I can tell. And, and I, I bet that, that's probably a common thing that you see, Brooke, with, with parents. People doing great, really relatively or uh, maybe even objectively great jobs at parenting, but are so hard on themselves. Uh, a thousand percent. I mean, thank you guys for saying all that. And, um, you know, I think one of the biggest disservices, if that's a word, in our education system is the fact that no, like no one learns this stuff. Like, how do we not learn this when we're learning civics and we're learning history and we're learning geometry and and multiplication and division and algebra? Like, I believe that it starts with what the hell is underneath the hood of the car? Like, if, if you don't understand how your engine runs, how can you literally mental health wise support yourself. And 
you know, I think that we have built this narrative from social media and rom-coms and Disney movies and like just, you know, books and throughout our life of, you know, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes baby in the baby carriage. And it's, it's, you know, with a white picket fence. And like, if it doesn't go in that order and in these steps and in that way, then you're, you're, can I curse? You're fucked, right? Like, you, you know, like you, you, you're, you failed, like you have definitely failed. And I think because that pressure is there, we then don't even recognize, okay, would my brain and body actually be healthy to introduce another human into my life? Would, would my brain and body with my individual makeup co-regulate really well with a screaming child? Like, would, you know, like what kind of parent am I going to be and how do I regulate even prior to becoming a parent? And my work has really extended, you know, I think because I started out in pediatrics and because I knew the brain of children so well, and I could see that it wasn't working when I was just working with pediatrics. I was like, this isn't working because I have to work with the parents. Like they need to understand the brain and they would send their child to me and they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just fix my kid because we don't have any extra time, you know? Um, but then I went into working with parents and it has kind of evolved. And I work with men and women, parents and non-parents because a brain is a brain. And most of us don't understand what sensory and emotional regulation really is. And I know you just basically asked what that is. It's basically, you know, the best way to describe it is there's so many different stimuli in the world. There's, there's light, there's sound, there's touch, there's this, there's that, right? And taste. And what we don't realize is that our brain takes in information from all the stimuli around us our brain processes that information from the stimuli, and then we spit out a response, which is our behavior. And most individuals think the language of your brain is your words, which is basically equal to psychology, right? And that's a lot of what probably the three of us grew up with is understanding the psychological lens of life and, and therapy and this and that. But it, it's the language of your brain is really the behaviors, right? So when you've just gotten home from work or if you work from home and you walk out the doors of your office and your kids are, you know, with the siren of the toy and, or the loud music or the TV or whatever it is. And you're like enough and, and you snap or like whatever it is, it's, you know, that is, that's telling me ding, ding, ding. Like there's an engine light on like ding, ding, ding. Maybe you are heightened from work. Maybe you haven't regulated your brain for the day. Maybe you need, some time between work and home life. Maybe you were already really stressed out because of a deadline or like whatever it is, right? But we need to understand that those behaviors are telling us something. And it's in order to be able to say, okay, what do I do with this information to be able to support our brain next? You know, as you're, as you're talking, Brooke, what's just immediately leaping out for me. So, you know, I'm, I'm Sylvie and I, we're not, we're not parents. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see if, if life has that in store for us. Uh, we've, we've been on a, you know, I've just recently shared publicly about, you know, our challenges around fertility and all of that. And, and, um, what, it, what immediately leaps out at me is example, I am very sensory, uh, sensitive. So for example, you know, when I travel scratchy sheets, uh, they, they would dry me they, this was like dry hands. I literally lose the ability to talk. Like my, my mouth stops being able to actually speak. Uh, when I, when I walk into the bedroom at night, like Sylvie, she seems to be less sensitive. She'll have all the lights on in the bedroom. I walk in and that feels like an assault on my body, right? Like literally I start to feel viscerally, uh, anxious, uncomfortable. You know, and so, I mean, this is what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And so many individuals have gotten proficient in the ability to ignore all of that. Override it. Literally override it. Literally be like, uh, like, and ignore it and, and just keep going. And when we go on override and in overdrive, that's when we become 
so dysregulated that we get into this fight or flight state and then we pattern that state, right? Because we're wanting to hit the, you know, financial goal or we're wanting to, you know, get the promotion or we we're wanting to get the to-do list done or, you know, like, or the kids kept us up all night or like whatever it is. Right. But, you know, Brian, you're a really great example of you, you don't have kids at the moment, right? You're on your journey, but yet you already understand certain stimuli and how they are affecting your life. And if you have the awareness of it, you can then say, whoa, I think we need a dimmer in this room or like, whoa, I think I need to travel with a softer sheet or like, whoa, like, okay, I think I need some earplugs, you know, when the dog's barking or maybe, you know, when a, when a child comes along, you know, like how can I support myself in order to make sure that I'm taking care of my own brain and body as well? Well, I'm guessing in the same way that, 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 that parents, that adults are repressing all of that stuff. We're then bringing it back to children. We're, we're passing that on. We're, we're totally. projecting that, that, that repression onto kids and wanting them you know, using all kinds of, of, of techniques of coping mechanisms to get them to shut down what they're mm-hmm. experiencing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah one, of, one of the things that I'm super, uh, one of the conversations that Brian and I have often is, is the impact of there being a lack of elders. There's a lot of olders, not a lot of elders and, and the area of your expertise it, 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 there's, there's a wealth of information and I don't know of anybody that was older than me yeah. that was talking about how to regulate totally. I, 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 nobody that I know of other, other than like, you know, in elementary school, I always got the, uh, needs, needs work and exercise and self-control. Like that was, that, it was like, I, I got told the way I needed to be, but nobody was helping me figure out how to be that. Right. And so, so, you know, one of the things I'm just, uh, just so curious about is what, what even prompted you to go down this beautiful rabbit hole? Because there aren't, to, to the best of my knowledge, a lot of elders in this space, but it's so brilliant and perfect and timely for what our world is experiencing. So what, what even launched you into this? That's a really great question. I think it was an evolution for me. I owned a brick and mortar facility uh, for pediatrics in new Orleans when I lived there. And I was trying to make it as client centered as possible, which basically means making sure that I was giving the child what they needed and teaching the parent. And I wanted the parent to come in and learn this information too. And I was a really young mom at that time when I owned my brick and mortar and I had had two preemies and knowing what I knew, my first one, especially I was more prepped and ready for my second, but I knew that the nervous system is the last thing to develop in the body. And so I knew that my children's nervous system was underdeveloped when they were born. And so when Charlie, my oldest, was in the hospital and there's, you know, the dinging monitors and the bright lights and they're poking him with with needles and IVs and all this stuff, um, I I was just hysterical and, and devastated. And I was like, you don't understand, like like he needs like no lights, like do not turn on any lights in this room. And I was really protective of him. And I think that then me becoming a mom and recognizing, okay, I know how to be an OT and I know all this sensory stuff, but I don't know how to be a mom as an OT. Like I don't know how to blend these two together because I could be a mom and I could be an OT. And there were many moments where I was like, okay, I've got to put on my OT hat and like help you with feeding because you are a hot mess over there. Right. But I couldn't blend the two together. And it's really within my own life when things started kind of falling apart, if you will, within my own family life and knowing that I really needed to support my children and making sure that they were taken care of in a sensory way and a mental health way and also taking care of myself. I think that I was putting myself at the bottom of the totem pole to where I was so dysregulated 
that I wasn't even recognizing it at that time in my life. And that was like my specialty of like understanding it within children. And so in 2000, right when I moved here, pretty much in 2018, after I sold my business and came here and I was able to kind of take some time to think, okay, what worked in that business? What didn't work? What would I have done? What, what didn't, you know, like, what would I do differently? I started recognizing what was the whole and the only way for me to figure out what was the solution was to try it on myself and to try it on with my children. And so it, it, it catapulted me into like this exploration of trying to figure out how do I get through to a four-year-old of how to regulate their nervous system? Because I don't want them to always be reliant on me to help them regulate. I want them to become independent and learn how to regulate, which is a whole process. But I really did trial and error in my home and figured out what worked within our home. And then I started talking about it online and other, it started with just moms. Other moms were really interested. And then we did, they all asked for a group. So then we did a group and to see the results with their children and themselves of regulation. And it just kind of snowballed in from there. It's really profound because, you know, part, part of it, Brian's I, and I's conversation about prepping for this was like to really think about, well, let's start from like the developmental stages of children and zero to two is different than two to four. And obviously the regulation needs are different there. But what you're bringing us to is really probably the most important part of the conversation. Brian and I talk about this in the context of intimacy. Mm -hmm. Right. That, but the foundation of intimacy with with another is intimacy with self. We've got to figure out, you know, what are our how do we stand in our power? How do we manage our mindset? How do we really embrace the emotions that that come up like that's foundational? And what you're really pointing to is how critical it is for us as individuals to be clear about our own emotional regulation and our own sensory issues as foundation for you being able to show up in the world for your children for and anyone for else the, yeah. for the people for that you partner the yeah mm -hmm. so i mm -hmm. think that's really profound yeah. just that that's the, that's let's my 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 heartbreak about not meeting you sooner the only thing there there is for me to do is to meet you and me where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you saying that too. Um, and the part of my story, which you all probably know, Brian, I know, you know, cause we've talked about it. Um, but your audience doesn't know is my husband took his own life in 2021. And I would assume that there's a lot of men who listen to your podcast and I desperately saw a need within Jonathan for him to figure out how to regulate himself and how to ignore, forget about the accolades, like forget about where we want to be in our life. Forget about, you know, the, the financial goals of like, like forget about all of that and focus in on, like you're saying self, right? Because it starts with self and self-awareness and self-realization and being able to connect to yourself. And that is really how you get to the core of sensory and emotional regulation. Because if you don't even know what you're feeling when Brian walks into the bedroom and the bright lights are on, how in the hell is he going to be able to support that? How in the hell is he going to be able to be like, got it. I know what I need. I need to dim the lights or, and in, instead of dimming the lights, he may just snap at Sylvie or he may just be in a pissed off mood and, and then your partner's like, well, why, what's wrong? What's wrong? I don't know what's wrong. Like nothing, you know, like it just snowballs. And the ability to understand this information is so crucial in my heart and in, in my mind, especially for men, because I feel that feeling your feelings is part of understanding sensory and emotional regulation and the awareness of your feelings. And so many men have been either taught or pushed away their feelings, or you have a stronger part of the logic brain than the emotion brain. And so that's just your makeup. And so it's, it's not really natural for you all to like lean in emotion wise. Well, uh, Brooke, I mean, I'm just getting, <clears throat> I get chills as you speak because you're, you, you talk about 
uh, you, you mentioned your husband's suicide a few years back. What I'm aware of too, it was one of the things we talk about in our work with men is, is a, a, a phrase that I coined. I, I call it a, a, a totally real condition that I totally made up masculine checkout syndrome. And this, you know, a lot of men, it's, it's interesting how when men start having real conversations with each other, it often emerges that a man has been contemplating, maybe not seriously yet, but contemplating taking his own life, you know, checking out. And, and if he's not check, contemplating checking out, uh, literally you know, killing himself. He's constant. He's, he's living in the checkout of his actual life, right? He's not fully showing up in his relationship. He's not fully showing up with his children. <clears throat> I mean, we've, we've, we've heard men contemplate all kinds of flavors of checkout. Right. And so, you know, I just get, I get the reason I think I'm just, you know, as you're speaking, my body's just tingling because I'm, 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 we're, we're hitting at such the heart of a, of a matter that affects so many men. And I know then by, by its consequences affects the, the, the women that they may be partnered with or, or the family members that they're surrounded by, even their work colleagues, certainly their children. Um, and so I, I think, you know, one of the things that we do in our work is we, we, we help men lean in to their own feelings to their own embodied experience, their own sensory experience. And it's fascinating to me how many men struggle with that initially, right? It's like, ask a man how he feels and he'll tell you what he thinks. <laughs> totally. 1000%. Right. And so, and, and this is what men then as parents are carrying. So I, I guess the question I, 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 this is leading to me, this is leading to uh, my language is stumbling. So here, there it goes. Is are there? You, know, you say you've worked with 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 moms, with dads. Are there unique challenges that say fathers may may be more prevalent in experiencing that uh, isn't talked about very much? I mean, I feel like I can speak to this, but I also feel like I'm not a dad, right? And so I feel like. I'll say some things, but then I would love Tate for you to either agree, disagree and add upon this. Um, I, it is a personal feeling that with number one, your brain makeup as a male, right? Your logic brain is a little bit stronger, which means your black and white brain is stronger. So like you guys think more in black and white than, than rainbows. Women have a stronger emotional brain, so we're always an emotional hot mess. That's just, we have a little bit stronger area of that part of the brain. So I think it's that. I think it's also how you were raised potentially, whether it was pushed down, like you were allowed feelings or not. And I think it's also the pressure that's placed on, on men. I think that despite us living in this world of such trying to have an equal dynamic or trying to have equality in all the different ways. And, you know, the feminism movement of, you know, we can be in the boardroom too. And, you know, all these things, I think that just because we've moved the needle doesn't necessarily mean that the wounds aren't still present. And, the teaching hasn't already been done, I would say, for, you know, our generation of adults, if you will. Um, and I, I hope that it's evolving over time, right, with the younger generations. But I just see so many that have not been offered the ability to feel their feelings, as well as there's so much pressure. Like, I don't think I even recognized how much pressure there was on John until that pressure became mine because yes, I was a working parent, but at the same time, there's, there's glimpses and moments of like, holy shit, like this is what he was feeling. Like that pressure of that role of honestly, for me, like, like that financial stability role, which is what Jonathan really, um, 
I could see felt he had that on his back. Like I carry that now and I have learned and, and needed to learn and has gotten better every single year as I've done this alone. But I've had to learn how to carry that, but not allow it to consume me. And I've had to shift even my parenting of being a little bit more logic brained and a little bit more black and white. And um, there were things that I was like, don't be so harsh, you know, don't be so hard on them. And I, I just think that from women, yes, there's a female talking and saying, I think we are really, really hard on men um, to try and be more emotional. And it's not their generic natural way. But I also think it's the pressure placed or that has that is felt on men, whether it is given to them or it has just naturally been inherited as a, as a male. Mm -hmm. Maybe a combination of both. Well, and what, what I'm really, I, I think you're hitting on those points and, and profound ways. And uh, one of the ways that Brian and I have framed it is that for, for men, largely, we feel like we have to perform totally in order for us to belong to a tribe, mm -hmm. right? In order for us to be accepted amongst our peers, to be accepted amongst women, to be accepted amongst kids, right? We, my, we have a family tradition uh, that every Sunday we have a family meeting and everybody goes around and compliments one another. I, I 50% of the time, the thing that my son compliments me for is making the money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. girls, daddy. and he you know and he compliments me about all the other things as well but it, it, there's always that twinge of like knowing that i have to perform as a man in the world in order for my tribe to really be okay in order for them to really fully accept me and so to some extent i've got to set aside my feelings because in order for me to go and perform and do what I got to do, sometimes I can't afford to feel it, certainly not for too long. And so that's why one of the things that you, you said, which I think is, again, so profound, is that I may not even be in tune with the ways in which, I, like, how do I bring that part of me online? If, if it, One of the things that I think men often feel like is that they're surviving the life that they've created. They got the house, the car, the boat, the kid, the everything that they thought that they wanted and needed. And yet they are feeling like their life is just a, a, a drudgery. Totally. And so, and part of that is in alignment with the fact that we shut down our emotions. So how else can we become fully enlivened if we, if, if we're not willing to accept the, the, the deepest, darkest, worst emotions, how in the world are we going to feel the, the greatest enlivenment that's possible? So I guess, you know, one of the things that I'm so curious about for you is you've, you've, you've been thinking about this a lot. How do, how do you help activate inside of men some aspects of them being in tune with themselves if a, if a man has largely not felt safe to allow those things to be able to be online? That's such a great question. And I think it's, it's individualized based on the human. Um, and it's dependent upon how much work they've done already when they get to me, if you will. Um, some I'm pretty blunt with. I'm like, I'm happy to work with you, but I like, I need you to know that like you're going to be a tough nut to crack. And a lot of times when I have clients that I work with, I, I ask that they work with me at least for an entire year. And the reason that I ask that is because everyone wants this like immediacy. Everyone's like, well, what, what can you do for me right now? Like, what, what is the, what is, the, you know, I've even gotten on podcasts where they're like, if you could just give me the three top tips and I'm like, Ooh, I'll do that. But like, I don't really know if that's going to work, you know? Right, yeah. There needs to be a lot of trial and error there. I, I tell my clients that it's, you know, if they are really functioning in like peaks and valleys, we're going to make them rolling hills. And like, I can't give you balance. Like balance doesn't like, that's just a word. It doesn't really naturally exist, but there are going to be highs and lows along the way. And I have to kind of be blunt with them and be like, are you ready for the challenge? Like to, to feel your feelings? Like, are you ready? Like, because there's no point in wasting your money and efforts and time in doing this. If, if like you're not ready to do this work, you know, and it does take a lot of, I'm in constant communication with my clients. I offer 24 seven support because I don't feel that just like seeing them once a week is enough. I think in real time is when it really matters. 
Um, and being able to trigger that discussion of like, okay, but like you you told me like what happened, but how do you feel? Right. And they'll be like, well, did, and I'm like, no, no, no. But like the, how did that feel? Well, no, 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 no. Like, and I'll keep going and going and going and going and going until literally it's happy, sad, mad, or angry, like or frustrated, like, I, like simple words that like, those are the basics that we should be teaching children. Like, I don't need, I feel flabbergasted. I, I, I feel, you know, elated. Like who gives a fuck? Like sad and happy will get you done just fine. You know what I mean? Because from that space, m- some men they they don't even know how to say that word. I'm like, yeah, like, yeah, say it. Or I'll be like, okay, well, how, how's your week going? It's okay. I'm like, well, what does okay mean? Like, what does okay mean? You know, because we need to be able to become familiar. And it's literally like a muscle. Like if you go to the gym and you're like, oh, I don't, I don't like my, my bicep and you're going to like go work out your bicep and you want it to get bigger. It's the same thing with your brain. Like you're just flexing the muscle and it's going to feel wildly uncomfortable. Your brain even may feel like there's an attack. It may feel like fight or flight. It may feel like this is so uncomfortable. I want to go back to what I know and revert back. And then we work through that if you revert back, because that's the more naturalistic thing to do, because you've maybe done that for decades, right? But if you, I always tell clients, if you feel uncomfortable, that means you're doing it right which sucks. It's like, cool. So you're telling me I'm going to be uncomfortable while doing this. I right know, now. I know, I know. Pay me money and be uncomfortable for a year. Yeah. Yeah. That's the yeah, promise. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to make your life hell for a little bit, but it's fine. You know, that, that, that reminds me of that acronym fine. You know, I'm, I'm fine. That uh, fucked up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. I'm fine. That's what I, am. uh, you know, it, it leads me to another question. Uh, you, one of your Instagram posts recently sparked that for me too. And we work with men a lot in this. I really want to hear from you on this. Your, your post, you wrote, emotions are energy. Repressed emotions block our energy, exhausting us or making us sick. Whatever is repressed will find a way to be expressed. So anger. Let's talk about anger for a moment. Because what, what a lot of men find themselves in is this sort of this bipolar uh, dilemma. They're either overly expressed in anger or they're completely repressed and shut down around anger, right? And and some men will just, you know, bounce back and forth between the two, shut down, shut down, shut down, explode, right? Then there's the men that are just constantly shut down, can't even touch their anger, right? We've worked with men that haven't felt anger in, in, you know, their adult lives, and it's scary for them to touch. They, they, it's so hard for them to even go there in safe ways. So uh, then there's again the other men that just like live at anger, just irritable, upset, constantly. Everything's bothering them. Just, just right simmering at at, <laughs> at, a, at the foothills of rage, and then with occasional forays into it. So, how do you work with that emotion specifically? That's a really great question. What I find is if there is, like you said, you kind of gave two examples, you know, one who's really shut down and then one who's just like constantly irritable and always on edge and snapping and and just pissed off and in a funky mood. And a lot of times what I find is that example of a human, the one who's constantly snapping, the one who's always pissed off, always frustrated, always annoyed, just very irritable, just like, like, just don't talk to me, don't touch me, like, don't breathe on me. It's just annoying, right? I find that those are the ones who have gotten to the space of burnout and complete dysregulation because their brain and body is so on edge that it's, you know, I like to explain the the brain almost like a smoke detector. So it's always sniffing out, you know, smoke. And like, if you sniff a little bit of smoke out, it's the alarm's going to go off. And so if you're already dysregulated specifically for that anger, if that's the emotion that it comes most natural to that human, you are going to be in that irritable space because if you touch me, the smoke detector just said, ding, 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 there's a fire. If you look at me the wrong way, ding, 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 there's a fire. If you know, it's telling me to stop, drop and roll, but there may not be a fire. And so what we have to do is actually recalibrate the smoke detector to say, I'm actually safe here. There is no threat, 
right? Like I'm, I'm safe in my brain and my body. And that takes time to recalibrate. It's not just going up there with, you know, a screw and a, and a bolt and, and changing the battery. Like it, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then on the other side, the one who has repressed all of the emotion and repressed all the anger, that could be for a multitude of reasons. Maybe they weren't allowed to feel their feelings. Maybe they're trying to make it through because they don't want to upset their partner or that, you know, they don't want to get a divorce or like they've been shut down so many times or they're afraid to speak. Like there's just so many reasons why that can be repressed and it can be from such a young age and maybe they're afraid to, to tap into it because they don't know if they let it, if they let it go, what it'll look like, if if it'll feel uncomfortable or if they explode, you know, there's just so many things in that. But what I will say is anger is one of the ugliest and most beautiful emotions humanly possible. And I don't think that I've ever felt that true emotion in a healthy way until I had to move through grief with Jonathan. And the way that I moved through grief was just simply allowing whatever showed up for me. And there was a really, I'm going to say like long period of time where it was showing up as anger. Um, and I had to allow it. Like I had to allow it in order to move through it. And I had to expend a lot of extra energy and release that cortisol and release that that just that extra pent up energy and, and scream into a pillow and cry and hide in the bathroom from the kids. You know, like I, I had to, and literally say it like one day, I'm not kidding you. My mom was in the house and I screamed at the top of my lungs. My mom thought I needed an intervention. And I was like, as I was saying it, I was like, this is so healthy. This is so good for me. And I was like, I'm so fucking angry. And I like screamed at the top of my lungs And my mom's like on the phone with my sister, like, you need to fly in town. This is not normal. Like something is going on with this girl. And I'm like, guys, this is fine. Like, I feel better now. Like, I just, like, I just needed to, you know, say it out loud. Brooke, as you're, as you're talking, I'm, I'm connecting with the first time that I really touched my anger also in a way that felt enlivening was also during a grief journey, going through a breakup. It actually happened maybe three years or so, two or three years after this relationship had ended. And I was just like, finally, like, I can't get over this shit. And you know what? Turns out I'm fucking angry, actually, you know, because I, I I had taken so much abuse. I mean, I delivered, I delivered my share, but I took so much and I took so much responsibility that and I was grieving this relationship, but not wanting to grieve it, you know, repressing it, shoving it down. And I was in the shower and I was just like, fuck this. And I was just like, I'm fucking angry. Fuck you for doing what you did to me. Fuck you for the way that you talked to me. And and look, nobody was listening. Right. It wasn't nobody was. I wasn't hurting anybody. I wasn't saying right. it to her. I wasn't, you know, that, that it was just like me having a moment with that emotion. And I remember I had I did that like maybe three or four times over the course of a month in that shower. And wow, it it it. I wasn't angry it anymore you. after that. It it, it cleansed. Really, it cleansed. And it was like, for me, it was the birth of, of a practice that for me became like an anger yoga. Yeah. And before that I had blown up, I had been angry before that, but never did it feel safe. Did it feel enlivening? Did it feel constructive? It was always destructive, hurtful to myself. I mean, I'd blow my own circuits out, you know? And so it's interesting. Thank you for making that connection. I'm, that, yeah, the, the, the thing that, that allowed me to do that. The mm-hmm. thing that I, that's coming to my mind is one of the, I think one of the gifts of Brian and I's friendship is that we've come at things differently. And I think, it, you know, I'm, I'm saying this, not as it's true, but checking with you about this, Brian, is that I think we've approached this at the other ends of the continuum. I think he started off really shut down around his mm-hmm. anger. I think and that's I start, definitely fair to say, yeah. And I started that that smoke detector for me was ready mm-hmm. to go off at any, any given moment. Time. And what I've noticed about myself over time is that I I really I mean this is you know, again the 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 both uh, beauty and tragedy of just meeting you now is just realizing holy shit like it it actually doesn't serve me anymore to tap into my anger. 
because I've been so practiced at it. My, my, my literal adrenaline, it, my cortisol levels, I need the other practice. So to your point is that we all, not just men, but all of us need different practices to come. This is why they can't just ask you, what are the three things? But, but it does have me, ha you know, be curious about, about the essential skills, mm -hmm. right? Like, so, so Brooke, help us tap into, because you, you've said that self-awareness is the beginning of this journey in many ways. That, that is obviously one of the essential skills, I think, but, but help us understand more of what are the essential skills that, that we as, as men and women, as, as parents and non-parents, as human beings in the world, what are the essential skills that we just need to be looking out for so that we can be grounded and regulated and, and enlivened in ways that really deeply serve us and our worlds? Yeah, that's a really great question. So I'm going to give you an example. And I believe that the first example is the way that most of us function. And the second example is really putting these tools into practice. So, and it's actually an example of mine. Um, during COVID, I thought it was a brilliant idea to paint one of my children's bedrooms. And I was like, let's do this. We got this. And my children were young. Like I thought they weren't going to spill any paint on the floor. I was like, we got like what I was nuts. So but we were bored as fuck. So, you know, I, I, I tape the room, do the whole thing. And we, we color the wall like behind, we had a fun day. Like we, we drew all over the wall and then I was like, all right, here's your paintbrush. They are spilling that shit everywhere. They are like, like now we've got it on the carpet and we've got it on the furniture and we've got it on the dog, but then the dog's going to walk around on the carpet. And I, and this was like in the beginning of, of my, like, Re really doing the work on myself. And I recognized these two specific instances. And I was like, I, I think I lost, I don't remember exactly what I said. I was probably dropping F-bombs. They were really young. And I was like, just go, like, just go, go watch TV. Like, just go, like everyone out, like, let me just do this myself. And when I had that anger and frustration in that moment, my children don't know that it has nothing to do with them. Right? So usually the behavior of, of what happens in that anger is we're just like you, like you all are both saying, like, we're just pissed off or annoyed. We're frustrated. We snap, like we do all those things. That's the behavior. Now, fast forward a few years, I got Charlie a new bed, my older kid, and it has these like spindles. And of course, mom's like, you know, I got this. I'm solo parenting. I can, I can put together a damn bed. I bought a, you know, I bought a drill during COVID. Thank you very much. I, an impact and a, whatever the other one is called. I was very proud of myself. I clearly don't use them anymore, but I was like, I'm going to put this damn bed together myself. And I was like, come on, Charlie, we're going to do this together. Cause I really enjoyed doing life skills with them. And this bed was like, these spindles were like, they, I would get one in and one would pop out and one in one pop out. And I looked at Charlie and I said, and I definitely dropped some F-bombs. And I was like, Charlie, I was like, I feel really angry right now. It has nothing to do with you. I just am really frustrated at this bed. I just need you to step on out and let me finish this bed. And you just go have a good, like, you just go watch some TV. And he was like, okay, mommy. And then a friend came over later that night and he was like, Hey, Charlie, how do you like your new bed? And he was like, I really like it. Mom said the F word a few times, but <laughs> you know, like, but in that instance, yeah. literally like the point is literally just saying the word. I feel angry sometimes can start the process of, of, you know, it's, I'm sure I am sure both of your wives at some point have nagged you to be like, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? And nothing like nothing is wrong. Like yeah. it's okay to say <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not okay. Like it's okay to say the words I feel angry or I feel sad. And the, the first step in that is saying the word out loud because I don't believe that we even allow ourselves the permission to say the word. And if we say it, and we, we say it to our spouses or who, whoever it is and say, look, I just feel really angry right now. It has nothing to do with you. 
they won't take it on. And especially for going back to the childhood stuff, like I don't want my children taking on my anger. I don't want them thinking this has anything to do with them. I just want them to know, yo, like I'm in, I'm not in a great mood today. Love you, but I'm feeling a little frustrated, but I just want you to know this has nothing to do with you. And then you have full blown permission to be in a bad mood because they're okay. You go, you go be in your bad mood. Like it's fine. What I hear in that too, Brooke, is you're you're teaching them something that a lot of adults still haven't learned yet, which is di differentiation, right? <clears throat> you and mommy are not the same person. Right. You're not the same. Yes, we're part of a system. Again, this is the the subtext. We're part of a system, but you are not responsible for how I feel. And I think because I think a lot of again a lot of adults, we see this in our the relationship we work that we do and that I've done with couples. Right, so many adults are. It's like men, especially we're in this fight. Like I, I, I don't want to be responsible for her feelings, but God damn it. I feel responsible for her feelings and they don't know how to create that separation so that they each get to have their own experience, right? They get to have their own experience with, and, and, and find their way together rather than just live in that, that sort of that power dynamic of, of, you know, it's either fuck your feelings or fuck my feelings, but someone's feelings are getting fucked here. Totally. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. you. I see you're you're modeling that at a at a for for your children. It sounds like like they're getting it. I mean, it's it's having at least even if they're not getting it consciously, there's an impact. There there is a there is a a, a result that reveals itself. Like yeah, the, the kid gets okay. Mommy's going to be frustrated sometimes, and that's okay. I'm also you know one of the things that I'm also just really thinking about is that there are men that we work with that that have gotten the explicit message that and we because one of the skills that we talk about that's just critical for enlivenment in life to be able to live in a thriving relationship is to keep your heart open as a man in the world how do you keep your heart open and one of the things that we teach is how to be courageously vulnerable as as an access point right to not just identifying what your emotions are but being able to express those and there are men that that do not feel safe to do that for a million reasons, right? So what what is your thoughts or what is your advice or what what's what what insight or what would you say to the man who just has never felt like it's okay for him to express his emotions, for him to be courageously vulnerable, in particular because he does believe that that could then get used against him at some point in time in the future. I mean, I, I, we've spoken a lot about like heteronormative relationships and I'm going to, you know, keep with that path. But I, I personally think that women are, are ruthless at times. I think we are really, really hard on men. Um, and I think we expect so much and we, we throw so much at them. And I think sometimes th that can result in a male feeling like, well, if I say this, it's going to be thrown back at me later. Um, I think it's taken me a lot of work to recognize my own faults within my dynamic with Jonathan. I don't think that we were perfect by any means. Um, but as you were saying that, what came to mind for me, and I'm going to speak from personal, like from for me, but I know there's so many different reasons that men don't feel safe to feel vulnerable and allow themselves to go there. But for me personally, I truly believe it can make the difference between life and death. And that is because I saw a man in front of me who was so deathly afraid to be vulnerable. I saw a man in front of me who was so deathly afraid to be just the human that he was like, Jonathan was a different man outside the walls of these homes. I mean, of this home, you know, he was number one in his company every single year. Everyone was shocked, like shocked when it happened. I was not shocked. Like it had, he had made multiple attempts. Like I was not shocked, but I wanted so desperately to get to that point with him of, of vulnerability and to be able to just allow him to be himself and I really think it boils down to trust of like, I can trust the human in front of me will 
allow me to say the things or listen. And sometimes it requires the partnership to do work, not just an individual to do work and help both realize how to have that healthy communication surrounding vulnerability and, and trust within vulnerability. And we tend to take things so personal men and women that if anything is said, it's, it's like a personal attack and we need to recalibrate that as I'm just sharing my feelings and I just need them to land. It doesn't mean that you suck and it doesn't mean that I don't love you. It just means, Hey, I need you to know, like, this is how I felt today. Um, and it's, it's really the, the biggest, the biggest part of this, I think is just know that it's going to hurt. Like know that it's going to be painful. If you have never chosen to tap your toe into the world of vulnerability and sharing and being open and, and, and being interested in your feelings, it's, it's going to be so uncomfortable. It's going to be so scary, but that's because your brain is saying, hold on. Like I am not used to doing this. Like this is uncharted territory and I don't like this. This doesn't feel good. This doesn't feel safe. And it's the bravery to, and not saying you're not brave if you don't do it, but it's the bravery to look fear in the eye and say, I'm going to do it anyway. Like I'm going to say it anyway, even though I am so afraid to say this thing. And there's been moments where even I had to move through that, you know, being vulnerable with my partner who I'm with now. And I've been with for three years. And luckily he was one that I, I have very much learned and had to learn over time that he can hold that space for me. And I knew I needed someone who can hold that space, but everyone can have it. It just might take time to, to work on honestly, both ends. It's not just the male sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really profound. Tate, as we, as we round towards the, the end of this conversation, what, what do we really want to make sure we ask Brooke? Oh man, I, Brooke, I want to talk to you for the next seven days. <laughs> <laughs> you know, really, because part I, two coming up. All right, all right. I'm all for that. I'm the yeah, me that. too. Me too. I, I just what the 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 gift that I think that you are bringing to the world is how normal it is for us as individuals to to we use this frame like to be painting our face the best way no we know how and to be leaving a trail of tears behind for ourselves and others and it's not because we don't want to do better it's because we don't know how and so in a world of where you know i'm trying to figure out how i can how i can be a dad to these two beautiful kids my my, my son was diagnosed with sensory processing issues and it wasn't until he got diagnosed with that, that I realized I had that, you know, it, it, I had no idea. So now we're, we're, we're bringing language to things that have existed for a millennium. Yeah. But now we have a, a way to distinguish what's actually happening so that people can have power in their life. Absolutely. So, so I guess what, what, what I'm, you know, often thinking about. And I think that what men are often looking for is, is the pathway. What's, what's the pathway that, that, that we can first find ourselves on and what's the next step that we should be taking. And I know that it's, it depends on the man and I know it depends on where he's at in his own journey, but I, I come back to this question around the skills. And, and, and more specifically, the emotional regulation. What, what, bring us into the world of how, how we can become more regulated emotionally so that we can handle what there is to handle and hold what there is to hold, whether or not it's in our, inside ourselves, whether or not it's from the partners that are expressing it or the kids that are trying to navigate through their world. How can we really step into regulating our emotions so that we can be, be the, the greatest men that we can be. Sure. Yeah. That's a, that's a loaded question, but a really awesome, awesome question. 
And, you know, I've talked about feelings a lot today. And anytime you snap, anytime you're in a grumpy mood, any t- right? Like I've said, like the language of your brain is your behavior. So when I first started this work on myself, every time I snapped, like when we were painting, I was like, how do you feel? Every time I got frustrated, I was like, how do you feel? Every time, but I was, it was the behavior of like, I was getting frustrated with the kids or I was getting short with the kids. And then I had to realize that feeling was frustration. I had to realize that feeling was anger. I had to realize that feeling was sadness. I had to realize that feeling was happiness. I had, you know, like. So that's a question you were asking yourself. How do you feel? Every right single time I saw something come up that I was like, what, what is that? A question you ask yourself is, how do you feel over and over and over and over and over? And it could take weeks for that to become automatic. It could take months for that to become automatic, but get really familiar with your feelings. And again, it can just be four feelings, happy, sad, frustrated, angry. Like it doesn't have to be these big words, right? And in the beginning, that's that's a journey in itself, right? To just own the the, the emotion and and especially if you've never allowed it to just be like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm okay. I'm angry right now. Or like, I'm, I'm tired or I'm frustrated, you know? And then the next step is once you master that step, it's where do I feel it in my body? So, okay. I feel angry and I feel tension in my jaw and I feel frustration in my chest or like, where, where are you holding? You know, I used to look at myself on zoom when I was with clients and I would always see my shoulders go up like this. And then I'd bring them down. And then I'd, I, you know, I'd be looking at my client and then I'd check on myself and my shoulders would be back up like this. And I had to really work on like, what are we, why are we holding our shoulders up like that? And I realized that that's where I was holding it in my body. I was holding it in my jaw and in my forehead. And you have to connect the emotional regulation piece, right? You have to connect the emotion to the body as well, right? Uh, Like the perfect example of this is emotional eating, right? Your jaw is a joint. And so when you're chewing, you're giving your jaw and you're giving your body and your brain the feedback that it needs in order to attempt to regulate the nervous system. And so when we're emotionally eating, it's because something's going on in our life. We're thinking about something. We are emotionally trying to regulate through that pressure within our joint, right? And so once we can connect the feeling to our body, then the next step is, what do I need? And you may not have ever taken care of your emotions in your life. You may not have any earthly idea what you need because you're always looking at, how can I take care of my family? I'm going to put myself last. What, like, what can I do to take care of myself? And that's an exploration in itself as well of, I think I need a walk. No, I don't think that helped. I think I need to go for a swim. No, that didn't help. I think I need to punch a punching bag, maybe go to kickboxing. Like, what is the thing? You have to tend to these emotions as if you're taking care of a baby. Like, you have to make yourself the chicken noodle soup when you have the cold. Like, you have to take care of these emotions. Otherwise, like Brian was reading one of my posts, they will stay stuck and stagnant within your body and they will just manifest and they will turn into long-term chronic illness. They, they will. And then the final step, and this takes months and months of time, but the final step is how do I go get it? How do you go get the thing that you need? And that requires you to own your voice and own your self-worth and speak up for yourself. And even when you feel like there's so much to do in your household or you're everyone's relying on you for you to say, I can't come home after work because I need to go to the gym or I need to go walk around the block a few times. Like I feel angry. I'm feeling it all up in my chest. I need a moment. I'll be right back. Like I used to do that with the kids when there was no one else here. I'd be like, I'll be back. I'm going in my, going in my room. I'd lay on my bed. Laying down is very regulating. FYI, I'd lay in my, and just like, the autonomy, autonomy to be able to say that of like, I'm going in my room for five minutes. It, it, like, it just allowed me to take control of my own self and life. It's such a powerful pathway. Yeah. That you've, you've laid out here. And 
Well, well Tate, what Tate it's, it's what we're, it's what we're doing with our guys. Mm -hmm. You know, as Brooke is talking, I'm, I'm seeing the path that, that mm -hmm. you know, when men come in, one of the first things we do, right, is have them start to identify what they're feeling. Yep. And, and what, what we've noticed, it's, it's interesting in our, we, we work with men in one of our programs for, a, for an entire year, uh, which I conceived of I love similarly that. because Brooke, I know it's like, I've done so many three month programs or weekend things, and those are fun. They're yeah. peak moments, but man, you know, the hangover comes quick and the, then back into isolation and old patterns yep. and all of that. So, but what's interesting. So these guys, they come in and say, we've, I've even, you've, you've seen me even kind of complain about this a little bit. They, they, we, they start doing those check-ins, what they're feeling in their body. And then they get so enlivened by that. They just want to do that all day long. I mean, I'm not exactly, not quite like that, but you know, in the certain platforms that we use, they're, they're checking in and, yeah. and, and illuminating, you know, what they're feeling, what's happening in their bodies. And it's like the intimacy that gets created both with themselves. And then even we get to know each other and see all the things that we're carrying and holding. There is an enlivenment just in that I notice. And obviously I'm not talking about parenting now. I'm just talking about men and their relationships to themselves. Um, but anyway, it's just, just, I'm just seeing that, you know, and then what comes from there, helping men, step into uh getting their need needs met yes and fostering the feelings and fostering the needs yeah mm -hmm. i mean so many it's it's you know you know thank you brooke to speaking to the 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 as a woman in in some of the ways that men do we get we do get beat up a lot you know mm -hmm. and, and look i believe that it's true and look hey I, I got three sisters, two moms. Like I am, I am, you know, woman power all day long. <laughs> you know, I've been an advocate for women for decades. And the more I've done men's work, and I've been doing that really intently for probably the last eight, 10 years, I see over and over and over how beat up men feel, how disconnected men feel. Uh, you know, you know, Terry Real. Uh, he said something really profound about the 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 original wound of men in our culture is disconnection. It's the original wound, disconnection. We're taught to disconnect, and so you know the work that you're doing, the tape, the work that you and I are doing. Um, it, it's it really is so much about reconnecting to ourselves as a foundation of of connecting to to others, to really being able to be present for others. And I'll just say, you know, one of the one of the reasons why I'm already now just so lit up, up uh, lit up about the potential of part two is that I do think that uh, of, of our conversation, I do think that one of the things that we we are really trying to figure out as men is to how to show up as fathers and it, to 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 show up as the fathers our children need us to be not to show up as the fathers we think we should be. And those are two totally different yeah. things. Yeah. And so, you know, I do hope that we can kind of put an ellipse on this conversation to come back and have this conversation about, because it, I do believe it's the great longing of men's hearts who men who have children is to figure out how do they break the, 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 the patterning of the past and establish new patterns. And what you've helped us do today is really identify that, that, that what we can do is to really drop into our own self and our own needs and our own desires. And then there is now an extension that we've got to figure out how, and it's not usually I'm going to figure my shit out so that I can then figure out my, it's like they have to happen simultaneously because I can't afford my daughter who's 13 and my son who's 10 can't afford to wait until I'm perfectly emotionally regulated. That may not happen until the moment I take my last breath. So they need me to figure out how to be doing that for them. And that's the next conversation that I'd really, really love and be honored to have with you. Yeah. And as both of you all were saying that, you know, we, we didn't even touch on the fact that we all have different smoke detectors. We all have different nervous systems. Like Brian, you said that you are, you have a highly sensitive nervous system. Tate, you said that you think that you have sensory processing disorder or some form of that, right? So does one of your children, you know, you can be an avoider, you can be a seeker, you can be a sense sensory sensitive. There, there's just so many different things as to like 
why doesn't my partner enjoy holding my hand? Oh, well, maybe they're, they're an avoider. And so if you understand your individual brain makeup, then you're not shaming and guilting yourself for not showing up in the way that you think you need to, because you're like, Oh, I like, that's my brain. Like, got it. Like, I don't like loud concerts because I, I'm an avoider. Uh, oh, like, got it. Like, I'm an introvert because it's too loud and noisy. Got it. Like, there's so many things as to understanding your individual brain makeup to then be able to say, this is just how my engine runs. Like, this is just who I am. And it's, I don't need to conform and be like, society is telling me I need to be. I can just be myself and accept who I am and then nurture who I am. Well, well I mean, just how much shame of rejection gets generated in relationships because of just in a moment, the body reacts, you know, maybe my, my partner comes in for a kiss and I just, I feel the sensory overload in that moment. And I need to turn my head, not because I don't want the kiss, but because I just sensorily, I can't, I can't, I can't handle what's happening right now, you know, to turn my head. And then that becomes a, 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 a perceived rejection. And a real rejection to some degree, but it's not for the reasons that it's not because you don't love them. Because I don't love them or don't want it's just it and how often is that getting blown up into relational breakdown on a daily basis? Totally. Yeah. I mean, intimacy is a huge part of relationships. And if one is like, I just want to be in a dark hole at the end of the night, don't touch me with a 10 foot pole. And the other one's like, well, that's how I regulate. Like, like, you know, like I need, I need that's a whole ball, conversation right? in itself as well. You know, flip on all the lights and have the party ball bouncing spectrum <laughs> of light out. Like, like let's turn on the, yeah. like, no, let's ramp it up. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Some need ramping up. Some need peace and quiet. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, this de definitely part one. Of, of, a, of, a, of another conversation to be had. There's a lot of questions that I, I still wanted to ask. And I know Tate, you as well. And um, Brooke, I just so, so much gratitude for you and, and for sharing the, the, the journey that you've been through, the, the, the grief that you've been through um, for, you know, you, your vulnerability to show up and share your painting stories. We, we've got those and, um, wh where can people find out more about what you're up to, the difference that you're making, because it's, it's truly profound. Sure. And thank you guys. This was a really great conversation. Um, I really enjoyed it. I am on all the social medias. You can, you know, type in my name, Brooke Weinstein. I think my Instagram handle is half of my last name, Brooke Weinst. Um, you'll see my big curly hair and yeah, I would love to be able to have everyone at least know that this, this information is accessible and the knowledge is there if, and hopefully it's, it's delivered in an accessible way. That's, that's what I try to emulate and get across. Well, well I think you're doing great work, Brooke. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be connected to you and, and uh, yes, part two to come, we'll get that scheduled up. Um, yeah. again, thank you so much, Brooke. We'll, we'll, all, everything course. that Brooke just shared will also be in the show notes. So, uh, you can check uh, those links out there and, uh, Brooke until next time. Thank you so much. Definitely. For this way.